The program this morning has been organized the way our Department of Plastic Surgery is organized, that is by bringing together bona fide experts in all the subspecialties, all the components of cleft and uh, craniofacial care. In fact, yesterday as I was pondering this uh, talk, I was thinking if I had the entire world uh, to choose from rather than just the Lenox Hill faculty, uh, I would be very hard pressed to come up with anybody who better suited or more expert uh, to give each of the talks uh, that you'll hear this morning. And as the chairman, therefore, I'm extremely proud of this group. Uh, on a personal note, we've all known each other for many years, and we're all good friends. We've followed each other through various institutions, and to be reunited again at Lenox Hill is a huge pleasure, and it's an honor to work with all these people to take care of uh, patients uh, with challenging problems. Um, we'll get started with this morning's program. Uh, I'd like to introduce Shelley Cohen. Normally you save the best for last, but we're putting Shelley, we're leading off with Shelley, who is our speech and language pathologist and team coordinator. Shelley. Hi, my name is Shelley Cohen, and my talk today is entitled Prenatal Counseling and Perinatal Cleft Care. I have no relevant financial disclosures. I'd like to start off by thanking Northwell and Lenox Hill Hospital for this amazing opportunity to participate in the next gen face cleft and craniofacial team at Northwell Lenox Hill. I have had the opportunity to work with these amazing doctors and providers for the last 20 years and I, it's been a dream of mine to be reunited with this amazing team. I'd also like to thank the, gen the giants in the field whose shoulders I've stood on and learned from. I wouldn't be anything without them. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the amazing, strong, beautiful, and generous families that I've had the opportunity to learn from and work with over the last 20 years. I couldn't be here without you. Let's start off by talking about prenatal diagnosis. In my experience, 70 to 80% of our families come to us after prenatal diagnosis. This usually happens by sonogram between 16 to 20 weeks. Here we see a child with a unilateral cleft lip. You'll see the hand on the forehead for orientation. This tells us that there's a cleft involving the lip and the nose and possibly the gum line, but not much else. This sonogram picture tells us that there is a bilateral cleft, again of the lip, nose, and possibly the gum line, but again, not much else. These sonograms are a starting place they're, they're not going to give us the entire picture, but it's at this point in time when a family is given the opportunity to begin cleft team care. So when does that begin? It begins the exact moment that this diagnosis is shared. Every family universally remembers the exact moment they found out that a cleft lip is, is suspected and how they were told. Perhaps it's that moment of silence that happens when the technician starts, stops talking and starts hovering around the face. Or when they leave the room and, and the radiologist comes back in the room. They remember if they were sent out feeling alone or scared, or if they were given information and reassurance that a team would help them. Universally, families have reported that they feel peace, have been able to sleep, and are less worried after they are connecting with a team. And each family has their own process. They will decide when it's the right time for them to reach out to the team. Sometimes they call immediately from the doctor's office and you hear crying at the other end of the phone. 
And sometimes they call three weeks before delivery because they've had the time to absorb the information. Sometimes cleft, even with advanced sonograms, is a birthday surprise. Many times the cleft lip or cleft palate cleft palate only, which is rarely diagnosed on sonogram, is a birthday surprise, as is microtia or a unique craniofacial syndrome. These are all, all, all often birthday surprises. And we must remember that congratulations are in order. A baby has been welcomed into a family. We must remember that Dr. Google is not the best source of information, that these families should be referred to a team. The team prenatal or perinatal uh, consultation will include many different parts. They'll meet with a surgeon. They'll discuss the surgical timeline, perhaps pre-surgical nasoalveolar molding if that is offered. They will learn about feeding, hearing, and speech. They'll learn about family support, and the team can evaluate stressors. And they'll learn about how to communicate with the birth, birth hospital. When they meet with the surgeon, they shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. They'll get the sense, is the surgeon sincere? Does the surgeon take the time to explain the goals of surgery? Does the surgeon present an understanding of team care? Does the surgeon explain care in a way that you can understand? Does the surgeon take the time to review your scans with you and what they mean? Does the surgeon take the time to show you photos of relevant past cases? Or are they showing you, perhaps, um, adults that they have operated on? And does the surgeon offer to connect you to recent families that they have operated on? I like to uh, provide family, a list, families a list of questions that they have, uh, that they might not think to ask the surgeon. And so some of those questions will be, where will the scars be? What kind of sutures do you use? Do you um, support nasoalveolar molding or not? Where were you trained to operate on the child that has had the benefit of nasoalveolar molding? Nasoalveolar molding is only one part of an excellent result that can, in fact, um, reduce cost of care and reduce the amount of surgeries over the lifetime. The surgeon and the family are involved as well. Who provides NAM on your team? What are the limitations or are there any to attempting primary gun line repair known as gingivoperiosteoplasty? How long have you been working with your team members? I've known many of my team members for at least 20 years. We share ideas, we work together, we're always planning and improving care together. When do you do palate repair and why? And is there anything that can be done to reduce the number of sets of ear tubes that a child might need during the palate repair? These are things that parents might not think of but it's helpful to give them questions so that they can compare and contrast the surgeons they might be interviewing. We want to give families the power to communicate with their birth hospital. Encourage them to reach out to the nurse manager in the newborn nursery. We want them to become familiar with the hospital policy regarding babies that are born with clefts. Are they asking that, is the policy that the baby must go to the neonatal intensive care unit? Or is there a policy that the babies can room in with the mother? Um, and if the policy is that the baby must go to the neonatal intensive care unit, why is that policy there? And what leeway might there be? 
find out what special bottles are stocked in the hospital and then bring your own anyway. This will help show the hospital that you are prepared. And encourage communication between your obstetrician and the team so that the, the obstetrician will know that you are in fact prepared and that your team is supporting you at the time of delivery and that your team will be with you no matter day or night. Nasoalveolar molding. My colleague, Dr. Brecht, will be speaking more about nasoalveolar molding. This pre-surgical treatment for some children with clefts of the lip, nose, and alveolus, unilateral or bilateral, with or without cleft palate, was developed by doctors Cutting, Grayson, and Brecht. And Dr. Brecht, on our team, is the longest practicing NAM provider. Research has documented the joys, empowerment, of, and burdens of NAM, and it's shown to reduce the cost of care and surgeries over a lifetime. It's important, as I said before, that the surgeon understand the care must be taken in the operating room when operating on the lip, nose, and gum line of a child that has undergone nasoalveolar molding. Families that have had the opportunity to prepare for the possibility of NAM ideally adjust better once they know that these appointments might be coming into their lives. Ideally, NAM begins within two to four weeks after birth, and exceptions can certainly be made, especially for premature infants. The length of goal depends on the treatment, and that might involve closing the alveolar cleft, lifting and shaping nasal cartilage, elongating the columella, and aligning the atopic premaxilla. Feeding. Well, personally, in my 20 years, not one healthy full-term baby has needed a feeding tube. This is due to the fact that there are special bottles, parents are motivated, they work hard, and there have been some wonderful nurses and feeding therapists that have all been motivated, and lactation consultants that have all been mated, uh, motivated to work hard for our families. The goal is to have the baby discharged home with the mother. Prenatal consultations allow for education and training with the special bottles, and they learn not only how they work, but why they work, again, empowering our families. Any opening in the palate, big or small, can interfere with the baby's ability to create suction, also known as negative pressure. For us, it's kind of like trying to drink from a straw with a crack in it. It's that, that, that experience we have when we suck and suck and nothing comes up the straw. In these special bottles that are most often utilized these days, there is a one-way flow valve that eliminates the need to create suction or if you're holding your finger over the crack in the straw. These are the most commonly used cleft bottles, starting from smallest to tallest. We have the Mead Johnson Enfamil Cleft Palette Nurser. This is a squeeze bottle, and many babies have done very well on this bottle. The parent squeezes, and milk flows depending on how hard the parent is squeezing. Each team has their own technique. Um, it's not used as often um, anymore, but there are some teams that still will rely on this bottle. Next is the Dr. Brown Specialty Feeder, and it relies on a one-way flow valve that looks like a blue hat. It fits at the base of the nipple. This bottle relies on the baby compressing the nipple, and the milk will flow out. After that is what was formerly known as the Haberman. It is now called the Special Needs Feeder. It has a two-piece one-way flow valve, a um, yellow disc, and a white membrane. 
and the nipple has three lines on it, um, adjusting the flow, the smallest line meaning no flow, the medium line meaning medium flow, and the long line meaning high flow. Following that is the pigeon feeder, and this bottle is unique because it has a firm side of the nipple and a soft side of the nipple, and the firm side of the nipple fits into the alveolar cleft. Um, this bottle also comes with a wide and narrow nipple with the wider nipple having a higher flow. And here you will see uh, YouTube videos that will teach you how to assemble the bottle and uh, use it correctly. Um, I will point out that some of the bottles can be used independently by the baby where they are able to compress the nipple with their tongue against the roof of their mouth and express and some bottles you can assist uh, by squeezing. This is an image of a mother feeding a baby. You see the baby uh, in an upright position. Not all babies need to be fed in such an upright position, but in general, some of the techniques we recommend are the head is above the, um, the head is above the tush, uh, which helps with reflux and drainage from the ears, frequent burping, and looking for signs of distress. Hearing, we have common eustachian tube dysfunction because of abnormal insertion of the palate muscles. Um, many babies do not pass their newborn hearing screening. Fluid does not drain from the middle ear. And all children should have a hearing test by an audiologist prior to palate repair uh, so that we can determine if there is a need for pressure equalizing tubes uh, pr at the time of cleft palate repair, most will need these tubes. The child's um, eustachian tube is horizontal and it's very easy for uh, fluid to get back into the ears when they are feeding. And this is a tube in place. Speech therapy can begin at the moment the cleft is identified. We want to educate families about good and bad speech habits uh, we want to educate their early intervention providers. We want them to learn what sounds should be reinforced before palate repair, such as M, N, H, and W. And we don't want to encourage sounds like uh, 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 and <sighs> as a way of avoiding the development of bad speech habits. This is a book that I recommend. Uh, for families and early intervention providers. This will hopefully avoid those bad speech habits prior to palate repair. The goal of sex, in my opinion, as a speech pathologist, the goal of palate repair is good speech. Those muscles in the repaired palate should be able to elevate, touch the back of the throat, and then assist in the direction of airflow out of the mouth. So we can make sounds like ba, pa, ta, ga, s, sh. The only sound that the muscles are down are nasal sounds, m, n, and ng, like running and playing. Once the palate surgery is over, we don't hear these sounds right away. There's a waiting time, typically 15 to 22 months after surgery. We will hear the ba and pa and ta and da emerge. This, for me, is the sign of a successful cleft palate repair. Treatment timeline. Families will lead us in how much information to prepare. We want to listen to the family and decide how much information to prepare. There's lots of detail to go in if, in fact, that's what the family wants to hear. We listen to the family and provide information as they are interested in. Psychosocial support. At this team meeting, we listen and identify supports and stressors and then connect with our, with our team parent advocate, and we work to 
um, to refer to those adjunct services that will support them in their journey towards having a child with a facial difference. We can provide links to parent-to-parent -to -parent support and we can um, uh, also provide uh, books that will help uh, introduce this to siblings, cousins, um, on, a, on a more friendly manner so that everyone in the family can be prepared to welcome this wonderful new baby into the family. Uh, families take time in choosing a team if they have that time. They'll often uh, pick a team that takes time to answer their questions. They will um, find the team that listens the most and they will pick a team that um, will be there for them in those hours when the babies arrive, which is often the middle of the night or on holidays. They want to know that their, their team will be there for them and answer their calls no matter when that might be. The American Cleft Palate Craniofacial Association has documents on uh, choosing a team and it also has a document on how to find teams in your area. Thank you very much and please feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions.